Hello, everybody, and welcome to Yale Divinity School's Transformational Leadership in a Turbulent Time video series. My name is Jonathan Lee. I'm a second year MDiv student, and I'm one of the interviewers today. My name is Monica Larges. I am also a second year MDiv student and an interviewer for today. And we have as our guest, Reverend Ben Groth. He is the pastor of Bethlehem Lutheran Church, a 132 year old historically black congregation in New Orleans and is a PhD student researching the relationship between white supremacy and Christianity in the United States in the Tulane History Department. He is also involved with Voces Unidas, uh, Louisiana's Immigrant Rights Coalition. Previously, Ben served as the college chaplain at Berea College in Berea, Kentucky, the associate pastor at Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Menominee Falls, and has worked as the director of music in Lutheran and Episcopal congregations in Wisconsin and in Connecticut. And today he's joining us from Louisiana. So after that introduction, Ben, could you tell us a little more about yourself? Sure, uh, thank you. It's, it's um, really wonderful to be talking with you this morning. Uh, I originally grew up in a, a small town in Wisconsin, Delavan, Wisconsin, and uh, I, I guess I, I've gotten to be a part of a lot of communities and, and places that have been far more wonderful and interesting than I imagined would, would ever happen to myself. Um, you know, maybe a, a short list of sort of, of places and communities that have been really important to me. Um, uh, I guess one of them would be working as a, a chaplain intern at the Connecticut Mental Health Center when I was at, uh, at YDS. I worked as a musician for a Spanish-speaking Episcopal congregation in Meriden, Connecticut. Uh, I worked as a vicar at All People's Lutheran Church, uh, a multicultural congregation in Milwaukee. Um, I, once I was ordained, I, I spent uh, a couple of years as the associate pastor at a large Lutheran congregation outside of Milwaukee. Then I worked as a college chaplain uh, at Berea College in Berea, Kentucky. And yeah, now I'm the, the pastor at Bethlehem Lutheran Church, a 132-year-old historically black congregation here in New Orleans. And uh, at the same time, I'm also a PhD student in the history department at Tulane University, studying the relationship between white supremacy and, and Christianity. Yeah, that sounds like a full day, every day. <laughs> um, <laughs> What has the past year been like at your congregation? What are you guys doing now in the pandemic? Yeah, well, I was just I was just talking about uh, about this with someone yesterday. In in January and February of this year, like we were excited. We were off to the best start in <laughs> in a really long time. Like church attendance was up. Our financials were like looking really solid. We had these exciting programs we were doing. It was Mardi Gras in New Orleans. I mean, like everything was great. And I really like it, like deep in my heart in, in the first couple months of the pandemic, just had a lot of resentment about that because the year, you know, turned into something very different than, <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. anyone, but, but then we expected it to. It felt like we were finally off to, um, this this great start and all of our all of our expectations got you know turned on their head um i think with that said there have been both blessings and and real burdens of of the pandemic um many people in our congregation lost family members uh from it Y'all may remember that, you know, in, in March and, and April, New Orleans was one of the first really big hotspots in, in the country, most likely because of, of Mardi Gras. And so, you know, we were affected in, in personal ways very quickly. Um, but along with that, we, part, of, part of the joy of, of January and February had been this new meal program we were starting called Community Table. And, and our original imagination for that was um, to, to have this free weekly meal uh, after service on Sundays where we would just invite the neighborhood in, bring in partners, have live music, treat people really nice, just 
you know, try and have this really like upbeat and kind free meal. And we had set the the launch date for that to be the Sunday after after Mardi Gras, you know. So after these big celebrations in New Orleans, we were ready to go, and um, we got to do that exactly two times before everything shut down. Um, I was I was cleaning last week and and found the church bulletins from March eighth, which was the last service we had, like in person and you know i remember at the time and i don't you know i think this is what everyone kind of thought at least at at our level of information was that you know we'll have to like make this sacrifice and and cancel things for a couple weeks a few weeks and and then things would would go back to normal there there were all these rumors i remember that weekend march there are all these rumors floating around New Orleans that that we were like all terrified about that they were going to uh, uh, lock us down for 72 hours, you know, and like seven months later, here we are. Um, <laughs> you know, it feels like we were very naive at that point. But part of what that allowed to happen in, in some kind of mysterious way was was we made this decision then to abandon in some ways the the vision of our in-person you know community gathering kind of meal uh, and we turned it into a to-go meal and that has really grown and grown and grown far beyond what we what we dreamed uh, it could be so right now we we provide free lunches every Wednesday Friday and Sunday at noon we're providing over 500 free meals a week. And, and that all came out of, you know, both on one hand, the work we did to, to start a small meal that we were able to expand, um, but also the huge need we've seen in our community. And, and you know, despite the sort of um, message from our leaders that, that things are going away, what we've seen is that in the last month, uh, the demand has really skyrocketed. Um, I think, you know, the first couple of weeks in March and April, when we did this, we could cook 150 meals and spend an hour and a half giving them away. And yesterday, two days, yeah, two days ago, we had 220 meals and they were gone in 11 minutes. And so, you know, what we've seen in our neighborhood is not you know, some kind of fantastic recovery, but really that, um, that people are really struggling. And, and that's what, you know, has really motivated us to keep this going and to try and keep growing community table. Absolutely. And you have community table, you're also having church in a little bit different way. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah. You know, I mean, a lot of a lot of churches and congregations have been doing some kind of live streaming worship or or things like that. And, you know, as we really as we talked about this back at the beginning of the summer, uh, we really felt like we couldn't replicate what Sunday morning was like by Zoom. Like it wouldn't make sense for me to to try and do like Bethlehem's service from my backyard by myself or, or filming it by myself in the sanctuary. And so we, we went with something very different. Um, so I usually uh, release a recorded sermon on Sundays that, you know, deals with the text for that week, but, but not a service. And then on Tuesday evenings, we gather for evening prayer by Zoom. Um, you know, in, in the Lutheran tradition and, and many others, there are sort of these very beautiful, maybe uh, leaning towards contemplative evening prayer services. And so at, at 9 p.m. on Tuesdays, I send out a link every week in, in my email and we gather for Zoom evening prayer. And it's become something that, you know, it would, it, Zoom evening prayer would have never been in like, you know, my five-year plan for things were going to develop at Bethlehem. 
but it's become something that's really the highlight of my week. And part of it is that it allows people to gather from wherever they are. So we've regularly had people join us from Iowa and California Mm -hmm. and Wisconsin and, and even like other parts of Louisiana that are a couple hours away, which are people who could never, you know, physically make it on a Tuesday night at, at 9 PM for, for evening prayer. Um, and we've also, you know, sort of developed our own new rituals around it. We have um, someone who provides poetry for us every week. Uh, we do, we do music. Um, we have a, a, a great pianist and singer who, who does that for us. We've, we've been joking about, giving her zoom Grammys because like the, it's this really beautiful music and you would never anticipate that that would be possible for, for a service over zoom. Yeah. Are you all able to do anything in person? Tomorrow, actually um, we're having a memorial service for a really beloved member who died a few months ago. And that will be the first the first in-person service we've had at Bethlehem in seven months. Wow. We're doing it outside, you know, it uh, won't be a huge thing uh, in terms of, you know, how many people are coming, but it feels like it will be very spiritually significant to, to gather in that place for, for the first time. Yeah, it seems so. And I know uh, New Orleans has not only had a uh, was a hot spot for the virus. There have been a lot of um, protests and other interactions in the city. Could you talk a little about that? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think first from like from like a I don't know the the historical perspective. It was it was a really important summer for New Orleans. Uh, the, the organizers in New Orleans had seven protests in, in seven days um, after, after George Floyd was murdered. And I mean, I've, I've only lived here a couple of years, but, but you know, talking with people who've been here for a long time, it was a really, really remarkable week. I mean, there were thousands of people out every night and um, it was, it, was, it was really extraordinary uh, to see people come together like that and to see this sort of uh, upwelling of, of righteous anger. And, and I think in, in the big picture, you know, without the protests, without record numbers of people in the streets across the country, I don't, I don't think we're having, you know, a moment of, of conversation about, about race or policing or, or justice as it relates to both of those things. Uh, you know, it wasn't just that like enough white people finally, you know, read books in book clubs and that's what brought the critical mass together. Like it was people in the streets. And, and uh, I think, you know, we definitely saw that, that effect here, here in New Orleans. Yeah. Um, you talked before once about a protest crossing a historic bridge, a bridge that is meaningful in the community. Um, could you tell us that story? Yeah, yeah. So for anyone who's, who's been to, to New Orleans, there's this very picturesque bridge that crosses the Mississippi River right next to downtown called the Crescent City Connection. And um, after, after Hurricane Katrina um, and the, the Army Corps of Engineers flooded New Orleans, um, you know, there were, there were very few safe places, high places for, for people to go. One of them was the interstates. And that's where a lot of people were either evacuated to or, or made their way to. And the sort of natural exit out of New Orleans by interstate, or at least one of them is across the Mississippi River onto the West Bank, um, which is also higher in elevation. You know, uh, it, it didn't flood in the same way that that the rest of New Orleans did. And so uh, a lot of people tried to cross that bridge and get to the West Bank. Um, what happened was that the police department from the West Bank 
basically made a line on the bridge um, with, with guns drawn and turned this group of, of mostly black uh, New Orleanians back. Um, you know, the idea that you like, it's not, you know, it's not like you're crossing, you know, the border into Canada or something like it's just the other side of the river. It's, it's not a different country. It's not a different state. You know, the, the idea that, that you would be turned away from crossing that is, is abhorrent. And it had everything to do with, with race and class. And so on on one of these nights of, of protest, I, one of the, the biggest ones, uh, we'd gone on sort of a long loop from, from downtown out to the Garden District and back. Um, these, these were not short marches in New Orleans. We were <laughs> really, really getting around the city. Um, we went up on to the interstate and tried to, to cross that bridge. And you know, in some ways with, with in, in a moment with a lot of historic echoes, I think, you know, this, this entirely peaceful, non-destructive march of, of thousands of people, you know, we were up on this interstate bridge, like a couple hundred feet in the air, like there's nothing we could destroy, there was no violence happening, um, was met with lines of, of NOPD officers, who um, stopped us uh, and then eventually for the first time in decades uh, fired tear gas as well as um, rubber projectiles and shells and other things at the crowd. Um, it, was, it was the scariest moment in my life so far. You know, it, because there were so many people packed up on this bridge and there was nowhere to go. Uh, they, had, they had stopped traffic to let us up on the bridge, but then whoever was doing that let traffic back up. So there were cars behind us and, and on the on-ramp. So, you know, if you imagine a couple thousand people on a bridge and the only way to get off is single file to the sides of a semi that's parked on the on-ramp. And then, you know, they... Like I still remember this this moment of seeing these these tear gas shells go up, and you know there was this moment of panic where where suddenly everyone started running, and um, I, I like I really consider it a miracle that nobody died, that that no one went off the bridge because there were about ten seconds of just total chaos, chaos again that was totally unmerited. Um, there was, there was no urgent reason for that to happen. Uh, and then someone not, not too far from me started chanting like, walk, 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 walk. And, and somehow people did. Um, like somehow this panicked crowd calmed down in the space of about five seconds. And, and I can't explain that, but I, I can say that without that happening, uh, it would have been a really, a really catastrophic event. Yeah. yeah. Are there any uh, repercussions in the city for that so far? Uh, I mean, functionally, no. So the city council did pass uh, uh, an ordinance, I think that's the correct language, that um, restricts the use of um, of tear gas by the NOPD, but in in the the immediate aftermath of that, you know, first of all, there was the deployment of of these weapons, um, several of which caused serious physical harm to people. Um, that again did not need to happen. Um, the police chief the next day. Uh, said that you know there had been no rubber projectiles fired that uh, all this stuff happened um, or all this stuff hadn't happened that we knew had happened from people's cell phone videos from people's testimonies um, i believe the the officers involved had not you know correctly filled out their their logs for what had happened that they didn't know that they had discharged these weapons 
Uh, and at least in, in the testimony before the city council, it, it appeared clear that, you know, there was some real breakdown in the chain of command and, and there's been no, no public accountability that, that I've seen for, for any of that. While you're at these protests, what, were you wearing your collar while you were there? Were you representing the faith that you, um, that you do so publicly on like in your professional life? Yeah. Um, so in, in, in short, yes, uh, I did wear my collar. I didn't have, you know, like a sign that said like Bethlehem Lutheran church or, or, or anything like that. Um, <laughs> There was there was a, a a journalist and DJ in New Orleans who who tweeted a picture of me from from a protest. I didn't know he was taken. I was like punched over my phone or something, and the caption said, "This dude is uh, this dude is a pastor at the church near my old place. Dude be at every protest. No. Salute." No. And Salute. yeah, yeah, and and like I was delighted by that because I didn't know what was happening. I didn't know him, but. You know, the idea that like someone noticed that that I was there was important. Uh, I mean, that's, you know, I think. I, I think following the gospel, as I understand it, like leads to that kind of action and mm -hmm. and should. Um, but, you know, it, it, at least in New Orleans, it, it wasn't clergy organizing the protests. I know that was different. You know, there were different roles in, in different parts of the country. Um, and th there were some clergy who were there regularly, but not a lot. And, and so I had a lot of conversations with people who, you know, either like just wanted to say like, thank you, you know, or we're glad to see you out here or, you know, ha had bigger things they, they wanted to talk about. Um, but but I really you know saw it as as my job both to be there but also to not need to be in control, um, you know to not need to be at the front or or in all the meetings or things like that. You know when when organizers ask me to do something like I'm happy to, um, but you know I think uh, I think sometimes there's there's a problem where. Uh, pastors only feel safe, you know, going to protests and doing stuff when, when we're in charge or, or when we're in control or when we're at the front or when we've made the decisions. Um, you know, that's when it's like, oh, like we've got the big group of pastors together. Let's, mm -hmm. let's do this. And I think it's both scarier, uh, but also, you know, maybe some ways more important to just show up and be a part of the crowd. And, and to take that risk of, of following other people's instructions. So really taking the, that servant leadership that Jesus calls his disciples to do, um, really embodying that even in protests, um, recognizing where your presence doesn't have to be the loudest one. Then. Yeah, and, and I think that I, I, I think that's that's true in a couple ways. And, and one of those ways is that, you know, if you look at like the church as an, as an average in the United States, I mean, it's kind of a, a, a silly way to talk about it, but like more often than not, the church has been on the side of the police, uh, on the side of, of white supremacy, right? And so that's not the whole story. I mean, there are really important legacies of resistance and, and, and protest and, and action in the church. Um, but I don't think like inherently the church has, has the moral high ground. Um, and, and so I think that's, you know, an important part of the dynamic, especially as we look at protests, you know, that, that are looking at things like police violence and, and inequality, a lot of times the church is upholding those things rather than, than fighting them. Well, shifting gears a little bit, um, we would love to hear more about your experience at, at Bethlehem, uh, the church that you're currently serving in. So you mentioned that it's an uh, old church, 
Um, it's a historically black congregation. What was it like for you stepping into this role um, at a church with so much history? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I feel really humbled to be there. Uh, I'm really grateful to be at Bethlehem, you know, in, in, in many ways, like, um, I, I feel like it's a, it's a complex question, right? Like how do I, as like, like relatively young white male fit into, to leadership in this place. And it's something I think about a lot. Um, and I think the trust that's been placed in me by this community is, it's shocking to me. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't like there's there's nothing I could have done to earn that. And and so um, that that's a lot of responsibility. And, and I try and take that really, really seriously. Um, yeah, I, I think especially as as a, a, a student of, you know, the abuses of, of white Christianity and, and Christians in America, I try and be conscious of the fact that that I bring both this like conscious and unconscious baggage to to any predominantly black space that I'm in, um, and like like I don't I don't think that's really enough, uh, especially because of that history. Uh, I, I was thinking about this yesterday. I, I had <laughs> lunch with a friend, Nicholas Lewis, in in one of my last weeks before graduating from YDS. And, and he asked me this question at this lunch that has haunted me uh, for, for eight years. I mean, it was, it was a long time ago and I'm still thinking about it. And, and he said something to, to the effect of, you know, you're, you're talking about doing this, this multicultural ministry and, and fighting racism, but like what's gonna happen when the church fights you back? You know, what, what's going to happen when the church won't change and, and you see the harm it's doing to the communities you care about? Are, are you going to stick with the church or the people? Mm. And right, like, that's a haunting question. And, and, and I don't like, I still don't feel like I have like a, like answer I can like trot out for like, all right, this is like the conclusion I've, I've come to. Um, so for me, you know, the answer to this, question about like my place at Bethlehem and its and its history is you know that that right now I'm in a community I love and and really believe in with everything I've got and I realize what a strange and and wonderful honor it is to be here um you know I I, like I didn't grow up in a, a a small town in Wisconsin planning to like be a pastor in a black church in new Orleans someday, you know, like I just wanted to be a Lego designer. Um, (laughs) But, but, you know, I think because of that history that, that I study and, and, and learn about and, um, and that question, like, you know, I'll, I'll be at at Bethlehem as long as they want me to be. Mm -hmm. And, and when that community decides I'm not the right person, you know, then, then I'll leave and, and, and figure out what's next from there. But I think, you know, I don't assume I have the right to be here. I'm, I'm really grateful for, for the chance to be here, but yeah, it's a, uh, it's a really complex question and, and something I really take seriously. Well, you've mentioned your studies um, on and off throughout the conversation. And as we mentioned at the top, you are, um, in addition to your pastoral responsibilities, you're also a PhD student or a PhD um, candidate at Tulane. So tell us about that. What led you to getting into the PhD program and what exactly are you studying? How is, is it related to the arc of your, of your general studies throughout your life? I think a lot of a lot of it goes back to to this moment when I was in college. I was in the um, the conservatory library at Oberlin, and I saw the the spine of this book that was called I think Hymns of of the KKK or Hymns and Songs of the KKK. You know, I saw that spine. I was like, "What the hell is this?" Um, and so I, I 
put it, you know, I grabbed it off the shelf and, and went to a table and, and ended up reading it like cover to cover. And basically it was from this um, sort of folk and, and political song historian. Um, and it was a collection of the lyrics of all of the songs and hymns that the clan had published. And, and as I read that, like what I found out was that in, in a practical sense, like a lot of, a lot of the hymns that especially mainline churches still sing were, were in that collection, right? These like very American Christian hymns, um, you know, the battle hymn of the Republic, the old rugged cross, um, hymns that have like really wide popularity and, and appeal and, and hymns that have that in, in multiple different cultural and racial settings. Um, and, and I ended up, and, and I mean, I was like horrified by this. I, I hadn't been exposed to that kind of connection between, between um, white supremacy and, and Christianity in America before. And so I ended up doing an, an honors project on that. I did some more work on that um, with my ISM colloquium presentation, um, myself and, and my partner, Brett Terry, who uh, sadly has passed. Um, and so for me, that's like that moment has been one of these really big motivating factors for my own work in, in history. Um, is is both to try to like shine a light so to speak on like the very um, close relationship between white supremacy and Christianity in America um, as well as like how do we reckon uh, with that history now what is what does that still mean for us that that led me to work that looked less at the 1920s which is what that project was really on to to early America. And there's been a lot of, of really fascinating um, and on, on many levels horrifying work on how baptism was used to create race in colonial America. Um, you know, without like going too deep into the historical weeds, it was like it was uh, English legal precedent for for some time that if you were baptized, you could not be enslaved. And it was very like conscious and deliberate decisions in, you know, like starting in the 1660s in, in Virginia, for example, where the, the um, legislature passed, um, you know, these ordinances that, that said something to the effect of, you know, baptism uh, does, does no longer confer freedom upon persons, but that was limited to uh, black persons. So you can see in sort of early America, um, you know, well before the revolution, um, this using of, of baptism as sort of the gate to uh, the creation of, of whiteness and the enforcement of, of whiteness as, as it interacted with slavery. So then now you're now you're a PhD student. So this is this is what you've continued to study into this program. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean it, like <laughs> it's not a schedule I would recommend for anyone else. <laughs> and you know, having small children and coronavirus happening in 2020, like it's it's been really hard. It, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, I've you know no other way to say that. Um but it does feel like really important work for me and, mm-hmm. and, and also for, for my community in some sense, um, you know, that, that what I'm doing informs sort of my, my work in the community, uh, my understanding of, of histories, both like broader American religious history, but also history in New Orleans. And um, that makes it feel worth it, even, even though it's, it's been a really hard year. It has been a hard year. That's the turbulent times in our leadership series this time. Um, so you mentioned a little that you studied music before. Um, mm-hmm. 
And I, I feel like someone doesn't have to study protest very long to realize there's quite a connection between protest and music. Um, could you tell us a bit about the connection you have with your community and music and even uh, your experiences with music in the protests? Yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of it goes back to this, this moment on the bridge I was talking about. Um, or at least, you know, the sort of most dramatic part of it. Um, shortly before before we were tear gassed, um, you know, be, before the police ended, what was happening? You know, there were there were thousands of people up on this bridge, and and it hadn't quite turned like really tense yet. There was there was still sort of this like feeling of jubilation that you know, people felt from, from the power of, of this protest and of all these people moving together. And I was looking for um, a couple people from Bethlehem who are volunteers with our meal program. We'd been texting and, you know, so I'm kind of wandering around and, and looking around and all of a sudden I heard this singing. And, and I, I, I didn't know the song, but it was like, it was glorious. It was in, you know, multiple part harmony. I was like, what on earth is happening right here? And so I turned around and there was a, a group of people singing. And it was, it was this shockingly uh, beautiful song. I think it's in desperation, we found freedom. In freedom, we found love. In love, we found devotion. And then there's one last part that I'm not remembering right now. But just, I mean, it was, it was shocking. And, and such a moment of like power to, to claim like that right to make music together, even in the midst of, you know, all the flashing lights and low flying helicopters over the bridge and, you know, that like, it was, I think this assertion of, of both dignity, but also just love and, and the power of that. Um, yeah, it was, it was a really stunning moment and, and one I will, will not soon forget. Yeah. Has that power of music reached into your church community as well? I think, I mean, I think that's kind of like a yes and no question right now, mm -hmm. because right, like, like singing is one of the things that you really can't do, or at least shouldn't do, <laughs> uh, based on, on what we know about the risks yeah. of, of singing with other people. And so I would say right now, to me, that feels like a real emptiness, um, you know, Bethlehem has this like amazing tradition of music, um, when when they were high school students at, at NOCA, which is the arts high school, um, the Sunday musicians at Bethlehem were Trombone Shorty and John Baptiste. I mean, like there is this incredibly rich musical history um, uh, at Bethlehem. And to like not have access to that right now, both because we can't really gather safely I mean, right, like there are lots of churches that are doing it, but I talked to both of our leadership teams last week and, and people unanimously felt they weren't ready to get back to church. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think in, in some parts of the country, there's a lot of pressure to like get back. Um, I have a lot of colleagues whose, you know, church councils are essentially making them choose between like their health and the health of their family um, and, and their continued employment at that church, uh, which I think is terrible. Um, but I think because, you know, New Orleans was hit so hard early on, and especially because of the racial disparities in who's dying from coronavirus. So like New Orleans got hit hard but the black community in New Orleans yeah. is mostly who died. Um, and a lot of really, really beloved um, cultural figures and culture bearers in New Orleans died from coronavirus. And so 
you know, the stakes of, of gathering feel very real to us and, and very raw to the community. So I think, you know, music is one of those things that when we get back together, we'll sort of be the sign that we are back together. But right now, you know, it, it's, I feel like it's being like, it feels like being hungry all the time. And, and that's especially amplified here in New Orleans, you know, like we can't have funerals like, like the community is used to. Live music is, is what drives much of our economy. It's how our musicians stay afloat. You know, like there, there is New Orleans because of the cultures that are around live music. And, and that's just, I mean, it's a huge, huge loss right now. And, and a huge, huge penalty to pay for um, much of the country and, and much of our state, you know, not, not taking seriously the fact that there are, you know, small things we can do to make ourselves and the people around us safer. Jonathan and I have a bonus question for you, if you don't mind, Jonathan. <laughs> All right. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah. So, um, no, don't worry. It's not too big. But um, so... If you're familiar with the series, so transformational leadership, normally we'd have someone, um, someone like yourself, come to campus and be able to talk directly to the students. Um, and so in lieu of you being here to talk to directly to current students, uh, we were just wondering what messages or what, what thoughts would, do you have to share with you know, a current student that is living in this turbulent time um, but as a student that has to grapple with some of the questions that you're also grappling with, but in a more, you know, what's coming up ahead in the future for me kind of sense. Mm. I mean, I usually say that, that like me giving advice to other people is, is stupid. And, (laughs) and so like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna claim like any, any like platform of authority for, for advice giving. Um, I think as, as I think about that question, um, you know, I said, I think I said something to the effect at the beginning of like, you know, where I've been in the communities that I've been a part of have been like much more interesting and wonderful than my own imagination or where my life would have been. Um, and certainly my experience at Yale was like that, um, you know, I got to um, work at the at CMHC, the Connecticut Mental Health Center. Uh, I took Arabic with the Yale undergrads. Um, I took gospel piano lessons with Mark Miller. The ISM, you know, allowed me to travel in ways that I had never traveled before in my life. Um, I got to go on a trip to Saudi Arabia. Like all of those things expanded my little brain in in ways that. I could have never anticipated or, or wouldn't have even known to really seek out. And so for me, if, you know, if I were going to be forced to offer, you know, some kind of advice to people, I think it's really to just like seek out communities that, that are, are, are going to change you, even if you don't know what that's going to be like. Um, and that, you know, the way through that or way to that, which is admittedly hard right now, is to show up. Um, you know, I was in, uh, when I was in Milwaukee, you know, uh, several several years ago, someone wandered in the church and said, like, you know, I, I keep, like, reading the Bible on my own, but I, I have these questions and like, I, just, I want you to help me figure out these questions so I can figure out if I can go to church or not. And like, I'm, I'm sympathetic to that to a point, but I think, you know, the, the like advice such as it is that I give now is like, just start showing up and, and like what, what will actually change you and 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 move you and help you grow is being in community with other people it's it's not 
figuring out everything intellectually before you, you like dip your toe in and, um, you know, open the door for the first time and, and walk in somewhere or click the zoom link, whatever, whatever that looks like right now. Uh, I think it's, it's about showing up in places um, where that are out of your, your comfort zone and that will bring you to something new that, that you couldn't have imagined before that moment that you wouldn't have known how to. That's the advice if I'm forced to give it. Thank you. And we appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Definitely. Try to take that to heart for sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time and energy doing this with us today. Um, I know we have a lot to learn about leadership in turbulent times and thank you for sharing what you've learned so far. You're welcome. I'm, I'm really, as I said, I'm really honored to, to be here. I wish, you know, it was a year in which we could gather in person and, and do all the like, you know, community and, and in-person things we like doing. Uh, but, you know, this is still uh, an amazing way to communicate and, and certainly fits with things that we did not imagine we would be doing. True. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, as well, for interviewing with me today. And I would like to also thank everybody for watching our series. Um, we have another one coming up soon. So stay tuned for that. And thank you. <laughs>